Ethical investing has become incredibly popular in recent years. The promise of being able to put your money towards businesses that don't harm the environment, exploit vulnerable workers, or engage in bad business practices is obviously very attractive. The idea of this practice is that by denying these bad companies access to investments, they won't have the opportunity to grow and continue their harmful practices. Some big names in the investment space have also backed up an ethical investment strategy by saying that not only will it do good for the world, but it will also do good for your wallet, because it can offer higher returns than a traditional investment strategy. The problem is that it almost certainly can't. Ethical investing may feel good, but under the surface, it effectively rebrands one of the biggest mistakes that people are making when getting into investing, not being diversified. What's more is that ethical investing might not actually have the positive effect on the world that you might initially expect from listening to the thought leaders in this space. So it's time to learn how money works and find out why ethical investing is bad investing. As with many of my other more controversial videos that might not necessarily tell people what they want to hear, this video was made possible by the generous supporters of my channel members and patrons on Patreon. If you want early access to videos and an extra video every month, please consider supporting the channel on either of these platforms. Alright, so before I start ripping into ethical investing, it's important to understand how it actually works. When investors are talking about ethical investing, they are most often talking about ethical investment management funds or ethical index funds, popular examples of which include Chamath Palihapitiya's social capital as well as a large selection of publicly traded indices from companies like BlackRock and Vanguard. Now, actively managed funds have their own problems. Multiple studies have shown that after management fees, only a teeny tiny percent of them consistently outperform the market, so already they are not off to a great start. But to keep things fair, I want to park those type of investment companies to the side for this video and just focus on the ethical index funds. These are far more likely to be used by regular investors and they also make up a far larger share of the market. We are also going to ignore the associated fees on these funds, which are normally substantially higher for the ethically branded variants. So trust me, I really am going to give them a fair go here. But with that out of the way, the first thing you need to know is how these index funds are made. Well, like all index funds, ethical indices are made up of tiny slices of lots of different securities. These thin slices will then be bundled up into an index and sold off to regular investors as a totally new security with inbuilt diversification. This is amazing for most investors because diversification is so important when building out a portfolio, but it can also be prohibitively expensive. To buy a capitalization weighted share for every stock on the S&P 500 would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some individual shares themselves can be worth more than the average person's entire portfolio. So index funds like the SPY are a much more suitable alternative. Ethical index funds work basically the same way, but they only let ethical slices into their index pie. There are two ways that they can do this, the omission method and the inclusion method. The omission method is the most common, and it involves investment companies starting with a base index of lots of companies and then kicking out companies that operate in certain industries, perhaps fossil fuels and tobacco companies. This works well, but there are inevitably some bad players that will fall through the cracks. Nestle is a snack company, so it wouldn't be omitted from this index despite not exactly being what you might call a shining beacon of moral virtue. This is where the inclusion method is preferable. This is where investment companies will individually pick and choose companies that adhere to their ethical framework. Generally speaking, inclusion funds will be filled with companies that are really trying to make the world a better place, and omission funds will mostly be filled with companies that aren't completely terrible. So now that you know what goes into creating these funds, you might think this still sounds pretty good. And that's why it's time to learn about two big reasons why they are not. The savvy investors amongst you may have already picked up on the first major problem when looking at how these funds were made, which is that by one means or another, there is some system actively selecting stocks. The more you pick and choose your stocks, the less diversification you will naturally have, which is a really bad thing. To demonstrate why, consider a casino filled with lots of tables all offering various games. For the sake of this example, let's say that on average these games have a house edge of 10% which means that for every $1 you put into a game, you are expected to make just 90 cents back. To keep it even more simple, imagine one of those games is a simple flip of a coin. If you lose the flip, you give up any money that you bet on that hand. If you win the flip, then you win $1.80 maintaining the 10% house edge. Obviously, this is unfair, but it's effectively how all gambling works. It's normally just a little bit less obvious. 
Okay, so as a player, how many flips of a coin would you bet on to maximize your expected return? The correct answer is none, or if you are forced to, you want to be on as little as possible. If you bet on one flip, sure, you might lose it all then and there, but you have at least a 50% chance of making some money. Statistically speaking, it only goes downhill from there. If you don't believe me, I have linked a Monte Carlo simulator in the video description, so feel free to play around with it. Alright, now let's flip this example on its head. What if you were the casino manager? How many games would you want people to play to maximize your potential return? You would want them to play as many as possible. A player that comes in and drops a bucket of money on a single hand is actually very scary to a casino because that player has almost a 50-50 chance of walking away with double their money. If a player instead decides to split their money up and play over 50 hands, they are almost guaranteed to lose that money. This is why if you ever go to Vegas, you will notice that most card games have table limits to spread out people's gameplay and give the odds time to do their thing. Now, replace casino with stock market. The American stock market has historically returned around 10% per year, so that means that if you are an investor, you are in the fortunate position of having the house edge. Of course, you could put all your money on a single hand or a single stock and generate massive returns in a very short period of time, but with the house edge, you are, statistically speaking, better off spreading out your money as much as possible to let the odds do their thing. Now, this makes a few assumptions. You could have insider knowledge or be a card counter, but both of those strategies are going to get you kicked out of their respective examples very quickly. What this means for our ethical ETFs is that they are intentionally foregoing the inherent benefit that comes with playing as many hands as possible, and what's worse is that they are often omitting entire games altogether. Let's say that tomorrow, large lithium-ion batteries are shown to give people cancer. This would be devastating for electric vehicle companies, but it would probably be great for the fossil fuel industry. In theory, a well-diversified portfolio would have exposure to both of these industries, and the losses in the former would be mitigated by the gains in the latter. If you were only exposed to the more ethical industry, you would feel all this pain directly. You may personally believe that ethical businesses are the future, and I hope you are right, but that is a belief, it's a speculation, and good investors don't speculate. Alright, now what if you have taken all of this on board and are still happy to deal with a slightly lower return in order to do your part for the good of humanity? Well, there still is a better way, because beyond everything else, ethical investing probably doesn't do much good at all. Almost every stock that is purchased to make up these ethical funds will be purchased from the secondary market, that is shareholders that already own the stock and are now selling it, rather than the company itself. That means that money invested into Tesla isn't going to fund new electric cars more than money invested into BP is going towards setting the world on fire. The money is just going to the random investor that owned the shares before you. Now, there is one counterexample that ethical proponents will use to dismiss this critique, which is that company managers have an obligation to maximize shareholder value. If their morally tainted shares become so unpopular that the value tanks, then the management will be forced to change up operations or risk being thrown out by the board. This idea is nice in theory, but here is what will actually happen. Let's say an investment fund decides to go ethical and dumps all of their oil and natural gas holdings. The price of these shares take a beating after the sell-off, but they now represent a better value to morally indifferent investors. If this happens enough, then sure, the share value of a company might plummet, but that only makes it more popular amongst buy-and-hold investors who might start getting a 5, 10, or even 15% dividend on their newly discounted stock purchase. This increased earnings per share will drive demand and counteract the effect of the ethical sell-off in the first place. For better or worse, people engage in the stock market to make profits, Going in there with an ulterior motive, however noble it may be, is going to put you at a big disadvantage. If you really do feel passionately about these issues, that's fantastic. Honestly, I am right there with you. But ethical investing is just not the right way of going about pushing change. You would be far better off investing wisely and using your extra profits to donate towards the causes you believe in, or even purchasing products from companies that you believe are doing good. Ethical investing might give you the warm fuzzies, and I'm sure there are going to be millions of comments in the comments section talking about how XYZ index returned 20% last year, but that's all missing the point. If you want to invest wisely, you need to respect the statistics. One index generating great returns over a year or two is no different from a gambler on a lucky winning streak. If you want to invest your money, invest well. If you want your money to do good for the world, spend it in ways that do good for the world. 
Don't become an ethical investor and expect to be the saint of Wall Street, because that's just not the way it works. Now, if you want to learn about another type of scheme promising to mix financial gain with moral virtue, go and watch my video on the dark secret behind those Amaze giveaways you have likely seen sponsored all over YouTube. A big thank you to all of my amazing patrons and channel members for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works.